Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Welcome to a special edition of Horizonte. It's our annual journalist year-end show. We'll look back at the issues and stories that made headlines this year and look ahead with predictions for 2014. The journalist year in review show is next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. This is the annual Year in Review show. Our journalists are Jim Small, Arizona News Service Editor for the Arizona Capital Times, Monica Alonso, reporter for the Phoenix New Times, and Elvia Diaz, editor for La Voz newspaper. Welcome to all of you for what, what is really one of my favorite shows because it's, it's a fun time to, to review some interesting events with some interesting people. And, and uh, Elvia, I want to start with you because uh, an important news item is the fact that you are now the editor of La Voz, and that happened in August. Tell us about that. That happened in August. I was appointed. I have been with the Republic, the Arizona Republic, for 14 years or so. So they appointed me to lead this new team. Uh, the idea is to integrate La Voz staff, really integrate La Voz, uh, into the Republic Media Newsroom, meaning the Arizona Republic, AC Central, and 12 News. Uh, in addition to that, to actually change uh, or expand um, our presence in the community and have a digital presence, which so what, we don't what, have right now. What does this mean? I mean, what would be the motivation? What does it mean in terms of the Latino community? It means Republic Media is taking Latinos very seriously, not only the Spanish-speaking Latinos, which obviously were serving through La Voz, but really taking a hard look at how we can serve Latinos better in our various platforms. La Voz with the Spanish-speaking uh, community, AC Central, The Republic, and 12 News. So in your new role and in, in, in the roles that you guys have had for, for some time, there were a lot of interesting items this year. Um, perhaps the, the, the ones that dominated the, the news the most were the Phoenix City Council elections. Um, Monica, um, uh, let, let's talk first about District 8. Well, I, I covered that race uh, in depth, and it was really interesting because in District 8, uh, the African community had held that seat for nearly 50 years. Um, it was a seat that they fought hard for um, back, you know, several decades ago to have that representation, to have a voice on the city council. And this race pitted um, Kate Gallego against um, Pastor Warren Stewart. And there was a lot of angst, and there remains a lot of angst in the black community because of that loss. Uh, Kate Gallego um, beat him pretty handily with us, about 61% of the vote. Um, so I, I think. It just seems that there, there was some complacency because, as uh, Elvia had pointed out before, um, even when that community had the minority, where it was the minority um, in a Latino majority district, they were still able to get the votes out and still, you know, win election after election. So I think it signals some complacency within the African American community. And I think right now they're trying to figure out ways to really uh, gin up some uh, emotion. What, what does uh, it also political. signal, Elvia? Uh, uh, a diminution in the power of the Latino leadership in that community because you did have a lot of the established Latino leadership supporting uh, Reverend Stewart. It does, and that district has fascinated me for a long time. You know, I covered it, you know, eight years ago when I was a reporter covering Phoenix City Hall. African Americans have done a tremendous job getting the vote out. We're talking about 4%, 6% of the population in the district, yet they had been able to win that district pretty easily until now. Um, and yes, the old guard, the old Latinos were supporting African Americans in this time. What fascinates me is that this time, you know, you have, you have always have a largely uh, Latino district. Uh, it has never been an African American district. It just been controlled by African Americans. This time, Kay Gallego comes and does a phenomenal job, and she's not a Latina. That fascinates me as well. She's a white woman with a Latino name who was able to take over this district. I just think it's fascinating on how she was able to do it uh, against Latinos as well. How long do you think the hurt feelings will, will linger? For African American communities and for the old Latino guard here, uh, I will say for a while. And and uh, Jim, I I, I want to get to the heart of the legislative issues a little later, but but there is a connection here because um, while all this was happening uh, uh, in the, in the uh, Latino caucus in the legislature, you had uh, 
um, Senator uh, Leah Lindstrom Taylor lose her position as, as the leader? Yeah, it kind of was, you know, in some ways, kind of a double whammy, I think, for the African American uh, political community in the state, which you know isn't large, but but has had had you know always had some representation and, and people in key spots. And, and Leah Lindstrom Taylor was the Senate Minority Leader uh, in charge, of led the Democratic Caucus uh, in the state Senate, and in October. She was ousted. Uh, it was kind of a they 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 had one uh, the 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 second in command had stepped down from her position and and they were meeting to fill her spot and there was a little bit of a, a coup that was orchestrated and so when they went in to go fill the one spot they decided they just replace all three spots and 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 the new uh, the new Senate Minority Leader is uh, Anna Tovar uh, from uh, from the West Valley. Um, you know, a, a Latina Democrat, and and so it, it, it's kind of a change in style and a, and a change in in personality and a change in, in approach to the job. And and, and and what was behind it? I, it was a couple things. I mean, there was certainly some personality issues. Um, you know, uh, 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 there was a schism within the caucus uh, amongst folks who were kind of new blood politicians versus some of the old guard. And Leo Landrum Taylor would certainly be considered part of that old guard. Um, you know, and, and, and there was also it, 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 part of that schism revolves around their, their approach to being in the minority uh, at the state capitol. Is is it better to sit back and oppose everything the Republicans do and just kind of be reactionary, or is it better to be proactive and to go out and try to find those areas of common ground and go go find where you can you can cut deals? And you know, I think the the whole situation around the state budget this year was a good example of that. You saw. Uh, Democratic leadership in the House really kind of take the bull by the horns and be be aggressive and, and work with the governor's office and with Republicans and Democratic leadership in the Senate was a little bit more complacent and more willing to kind of sit back and, and watch everything develop while there were some other Democrats in the Senate who are now in leadership who were more actively involved and were working to try to cut to try to to try to come to some kind of an agreement. So we'll come back to the legislature. Uh, before we do that, I want to cover the, the uh, two other contentious um, uh, city council races you had in District 4, um, what some have referred to as, as the legacy race between uh, Pastor and Johnson. Yeah, that was really interesting because there was a lot of that, uh, you, a lot of involvement both from Ed Pastor and uh, Paul Johnson in that race. And, uh, you know, when Laura Pastor ran against Michael Nowakowski back when it was District 7 um, it, uh, years back, um, she she lost in the runoff, and I think that that really taught her a lesson. Part of part of what the scuttlebutt was is she didn't work hard enough last time, and I think she really made up for it this time. Um, and she was the underdog going into the runoff. She was she? right because uh, you know everybody thought that Justin Johnson, because he was backed by a lot of the development community and um, you know so folks with a lot of uh, money to contribute. Um, and he had the name as well. I mean, both had the names. You know, the relatives' names, right? Right. And I think they both, I mean, as much as they denied that they uh, that, that that was a factor, I mean, certainly both of them used that to their advantage when it came to raising money and, uh, um, you know, going out and, and, and just trying to say, you know, trying to, you know, ride the coattails. And I know they don't like that, but uh, that really was, was the fact. And so I think Laura outworked. Um, and I think toward the end there, you know, she did get a lot of support from some of the other campaigns, uh, maybe from the Gallego campaign that was more in locked in for Kate. And, and, and that was an observation you had made, Jim. And, and what evidence is there of that? Well, just from, uh, you know, talking with folks that are close to the Gallego campaign, I mean, when it, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier that, that she won pretty handily in her, in her race. And, you know, it's pretty clear that they didn't need to have the, the, the campaign machinery that they had in place for the, for the initial election. Um, which almost got them <laughs> to avoid a runoff, you know, they were able to, to kind of shift some of that, you know, and, and, and move some of those volunteers and, 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 and some of the people who were, you know, the foot soldiers on the ground. Uh, they didn't really need that big of a pull, I, I don't think, to beat Warren Stewart. So they, you know, they saw a need and saw an ally who, who needed some help. And I think the difference here is the Gallego campaign was young, was energetic, and you, you were talking about sort of the complacency of the same people. African Americans had been traditionally aggressive at the legislature, at the state level, in the community. And this time, I don't think they have been that aggressive. And you see a new wave of Latinos um, at the city council level, at the legislature, you see different names running for office, which you did not see at the city um, in District 8, for instance. I mean, in the African American community, I do not see any new faces, any young folks, unless you do see them there. Um, 
well, getting Lawrence ready Robinson, to run. Lawrence, Lawrence Robinson, who ran in the in the primary against and, uh, Pastor Stewart and also Kay Gallegos, he. Um, well, he was a new face, but that was almost used against him, wasn't it? That it, he was kind of an interloper, it, it was, at least that's how they tried right. to characterize well, it. Well, and I think that that kind of goes back to the way these candidates were chosen. You mentioned that it was the you know established Latino leaders, the established leaders in the black community who pretty much handpicked uh, Pastor Stewart you know, in the basement of his church. And I think that that goes to um, where's the community discussion? And I think part, that's part of why there is that complacency there. Um, they have to get their voters excited again, and you know, just in talking to some some of those leaders in the back community, they hope that this is going to be what um, rouses everybody up and gets them back out to the polls, and you know, to sort of find that passion again. That despite being a minority, as Elvia pointed out, was able, you know, that they were able to hold on to that seat for almost five decades. Jim, uh, the last uh, uh, city council election I want to talk about is, is kind of a. Uh, was viewed by some at least as a referendum on, on the power of unions in the city of Phoenix, and that's the, the um, uh, decisio um, uh, election. Uh, how do you assess that one? Well, you, you know, he, it, it was a campaign with a lot of money. I don't, I'm sure Monica probably has a better grasp as to how much money was, was spent or, or Elvia does, but I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars that were spent by, by the, both the campaigns and then by the outside groups, so, you know, both pro decisio and uh, uh, pro parks. parks. Um, you know, and, and, and it was largely the unions, firefighters union especially, it was really going after DeCicio, which is ironic, of course, because they were the ones that helped get him into office in the first place a number of years ago. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's that, that, that's got a, a, whole, a whole other subtext to it. But, uh, you know, DeCicio ultimately won rather comfortably. I mean, you know, he, he won by, you know, about 10 points. And, and uh, for for a race with that much money that was being thrown aw thrown around, and as you said, kind of a referendum on on uh, Sal's uh, attacks on the pension system and, and his his uh, what what some would say is a, almost a singular focus on this pension issue and this this kind of uh, anti government employee uh, kind of kind of position that the voters there don't have a problem with that. They like it. They like what he's doing, and, and they support him. And, and you know, I think that that really. It, he passed the referendum at the end of the day. So in let's that, move, go ahead. Oh, in, that di in that district, yeah. right? I mean, sure. yeah, he has his base. Um, you know, the fact that somebody was, was willing to step up and, and run against an incumbent and still, I mean, t I know 10 points is a big, big margin in any election. Um, and there was a lot of money thrown around on both sides. But, I, you know, I, I think that there is um, generally Phoenix is, is, I mean, you can see, is, is not, I don't know if I say pro-union, but. But the you, fire, firefighters aren't going away. The firefighters yeah. aren't so going away. So let, let's leave the sense. topic at, at that point and, and, and move on to the legislature where, where the, uh, the overall dominating issue seemed to be the governor's decision to expand Medicaid, and that had all kinds of reverberations. Just give us a quick summary. It did. It subsumed everything about the session. I mean, it, it basically everything boiled down to Medicaid expansion and, and the governor's push for it and Republican leaders' opposition to it. And, and by and large, most Republican lawmakers were opposed to it. And at the end of the day, it resulted in an unprecedented move where the governor called a special session, formed an alliance with a small group of Republicans and all of the Democrats, and they passed a budget you know, basically upended leadership and told them, if you want to oppose this, we will go ahead and make you no longer, you will be the ex-leaders of your chambers and we will depose you. And so they, they basically kind of sat back and said, okay, well, we'll, we'll fight the good fight and we'll, we'll give all of our speeches and we'll do everything we can to oppose it, but ultimately this is going to pass or fail on the votes. And so so it, it, it made Democrats relevant in, in, in this session and um, uh, it may make them relevant in the next session because of the threats of retribution against those who supported the governor, the moderate Republicans. It, 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 this was the topic that Democrats were waiting for because they had been pretty insignificant, uh, politically speaking, because you know the, the, the legislature has been controlled by Republicans, the governor is a, is, is a Republican. So, so for years they have not been able to do anything. So this was their time to do something and, and help the governor. I'm still curious about the motivation of the governor. I mean, she had nothing to lose by doing this politically. She can't run ag uh, again. She doesn't have anyone that she's supporting right now that will hurt. What was her motivation? You know, I, I think when you look at the way Governor Brewer um, you know, has handled herself in office, I think the one thing you can say about her is that for as conservative as she is, she also comes from a background of pragmatism where sometimes you have to make decisions that 
you don't want to make, but but you've got to do them. I mean, you look at the Prop 100 sales tax, I and mean, that was another issue where she went against the grain politically. You know, certainly within and, within and the Republican the, the, caucus. The common wisdom was that on a dollars and cents basis, this was something that should have been done, and it was done. It, it was. I mean, if you you can almost look at Prop 100 and this Medicaid expansion kind of in the same light. You know, where it's okay, we're in a certain financial situation, and all of the numbers say we need to go do something that's that's unpleasant or that we don't want to do. And so in, in the case of a sales tax, the governor backed it. In the case of Medicaid expansion, you know, er, er, we had to fund, the voters of Arizona have, have on several occasions said that we need to fund, we need to cover people who make up to 100% of the federal poverty limit. In a lot of states, it's lower. It's 50% or it was 33%. Arizona was 100%. We'd cut that during the recession. And it was always designed to be a temporary cut. And so the governor said we need to restore that funding. And if we're going to do it, it's going to cost us this large amount of money. But if we expand to what uh, the Affordable Care Act requires, it's going to cost us about a quarter of that amount of money because we're going to get so it. It made sense to do it, and, 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 and she did it. Um, yeah. The other big issue that seems to have dominated the whole year, but actually it's, it's more the last quarter, and also involves the governor, is CPS. And, and Monica, you've written about... Um, uh, in, in some respects, just the opposite of what CPS is being criticized for right now, which is their, their lack of follow through. And you've written about uh, what you consider to be overzealous activities by CPS. Yeah, uh, Arizona, I mean, the CPS system is just clearly broken and, and, and it, it just, it's, it's so difficult to see how it could possibly be repaired. But um, you hear now after the, you know, the announcement or the discovery of all these cases that when an uninvestigated child abuse cases, that, um, well, you have, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, when, when you have um, CPS not acting enough, not doing enough, but the, the story that I reported on, um, which is interesting to me, especially now that uh, some police departments are talking about uh, investigating some of these cases that went um, just unheard, uh, but what, what you have is that um, with, with the police departments investigating this particular case that I looked into, they cleared the parents of any wrongdoing in the abuse of their kid, but CPS still removed both of the children. So from perhaps them. an overreaction to an the overreaction. criticism. And the other thing that was interesting in that was that um, the number of uh, parental rights that were severed has really increased over the years, I think almost fivefold. So in the past, there had been a few cases that really got CPS highly criticized for not doing enough, maybe children that had died in the care of um, you know, their parents or their foster homes when CPS was already aware that there were problems. So I think that that showed that there was an overcorrection. And so then, you know, a, a child is injured, and even though, in, at least in the case that I investigated, this young Guatemalan couple had their parental rights severed, even after the Phoenix Police Department cleared of, of any wrongdoing, CPS still went ahead and severed those rights. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is a sad situation. Right. And, and, and also, speaking of inconsistencies, Jim, um, uh, the allegations of that, that uh, this practice of marking uh, NI not investigated uh, on so many files, 6,000 or more, um, was a revelation. I, I think you just broke a story that, that uh, the, the legislature and the governor's office actually had this information for some time. It, yeah, it was interesting. You know, the, uh, the Department of Economic Security, which oversees CPS, had, had said a month ago that, you know, we found these cases and, and this is news to us. And as it turns out, I, it really shouldn't have been news to them because it was in reports that they were sending to the governor and the legislature. They send twice yearly reports. And in those reports was lists of cases clearly labeled not investigated and and those are these cases they were in these reports and and so now the, the department's kind of shifted its tone a little bit and, and, go, and gone from yeah we we didn't know about these cases to well the legislature and the governor's office should have known about them because we gave them this information well and and child care uh, advocacy groups were were questioning these matters right? yeah you know one of my colleagues spoke with some of these ch child care advocates and and said why didn't you see these this stuff in these reports, and they said we did. We Do saw it. Do you think it. they were reading the reports at all, oh, or just that's passing <laughs> them out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's 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 the other thing. You know, I mean, in the governor's office, it'll go to staff. It's not going to land on the governor's right. desk. It'll go to staff, and they'll prepare a report on it. Same with the legislature, by and large. Um, but the legislators we talked with, and and the child care advocates who received these reports, they said that they asked CPS about them, and and they they had questions about these not investigated cases, and they were told either that they were cases where the allegations were so minimal as to not really require an investigation, or that 
that was just temporary and that they were being investigated at the end of the day. As so it turns I, out, I, that was not the case. I think this is going to continue to roil into the new year, and we're going to talk about predictions in a few minutes. But, Elvia, the other big issue, uh, and perennial big issue in Arizona, was immigration. Um, uh, the year started with, with a lot of hope that we would see immigration reform, uh, but we didn't. Latinos made a huge deal about the fact that they voted and they should have, and that's the only reason why we were talking about an immigration reform at the federal level. Uh, Latinos did did vote, and therefore Republicans had no choice but to pay attention to immigration reform, and they saw it as their opportunity to reach out to, to Latinos. I think that lasted for about three months, you know, the real optimism, the hope that something was going to happen. We had something um, coming out of the we Senate. We had something coming out of the Senate. It was approved. I mean, everyone was talking about it. There was, it seemed to be compromised. We had eight senators working on um, on the issue, bipartisan, Republicans, Democrats were all happy uh, working together, and it just didn't happen. And you were mentioning that, you know, it was a House committee that actually, you know, stopped it. I didn't think it was going to happen uh, because there's not the political will. But, but it did bring out um, uh, what seems to be more activism by the Dreamers, a lot of activity from those, those kids. Absolutely. I, I think there was a lot of excitement, as Elvia pointed out. Um, you know, and, and they may not, even though they, they made a lot I of noise. I should mention that you predicted last year that there would be immigration reform I this did. year. <laughs> I did. I was wrong. Um, right. The, the, the Dreamers, they're just uh, very passionate about uh, about this issue. And even though they made a lot of noise and, and, you know, went to Washington and talked to federal lawmakers and really pushed hard for it, um, they may not have had that great of an impact there, but certainly in local elections, uh, they were behind them, you know, supporting Kay Gallego and um, even her opponent, Lawrence Robinson, who didn't make it into the general election. But there is a lot of passion there, and, and I've written some stories about that. I think the thing that is, is interesting is that these young people who can't vote are out there rallying their community and, you know, their neighbors and their families to vote. and. I, I don't see that slowing down. I think at least locally there's still there's still a lot of passion, there's still a lot of hope. And um, the fact that they are having some significant impact in local elections, I, I think that's going to give them the will to keep keep on moving forward. Fighting. Before we go on to our predictions, just one other uh, somewhat immigration related um, matter, uh, Jim, was the findings by the federal court with respect to racial profiling by the sheriff's office. Yeah, it was a conclusion of, of a long-running lawsuit uh, uh, alleging racial profiling, and, and the court concluded that yes, uh, there was racial profiling that happened with MCSO, and and you know, they were they were acting unconstitutionally in doing so, and, and so right now they're haggling over a monitor. That was kind of the, the the solution that they've set upon is to put someone in place basically to oversee what happens in the sheriff's department, and. And so right now they're they're going back and forth, and, and there's some appeals, of course, with the initial ruling. Uh, so that this is an issue I'm sure we'll be talking about at next year's round table. <laughs> well, Elvia, uh, you've already indicated that you didn't think there was going to be immigration reform this year, and I assume your prediction for next year is also no. Especially knowing. next year, there will definitely not be an immigration reform next year. We're getting closer to a presidential election. Uh, I believe this was a year to do it. Barack Obama could have done uh, what he did with the Dreamers. You know, he could have. You know, but you don't think an anything. Going to happen next year. No. Uh, w what about the sheriff? Do you have any predictions with respect to the sheriff? I think finally something is going to happen with the sheriff. I I I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I, I just know that something huge is is going to happen. I just feel it. Good or bad from his perspective? Bad. Oh, well, that'll be interesting to see if we come back. Monica, your predictions for next year? Well, unfortunately, I I, I really don't think much of anything is going to change in Arizona. I think that. Um, with the Republican controlling the legislature and um, having a, a Republican governor just seems like a, a, a given. Um, I think that the steady drumbeat uh, against uh, Im immigrants here is going to continue. The governor just expanded or had expanded the ban on driver's license for any type of immigrant now. I think that there's going to continue to be that steady beat against uh, unions and government employees and yeah, so it, I guess my prediction is that things are going to stay the things same will stay here. The same. <laughs> and, and, and Jim, um, w a topic we should have covered but we ran out of time, uh, and maybe you can touch on your predictions, is, is uh, the race for uh, governor and, and what we might see there. 
Uh, that that one's tough to, to figure out. I, I'm not bold enough to make any predictions on the race for governor, um, other than the stunningly but you have to make a prediction. The, the stunningly obvious. We're asking for one. Yeah, right the now. stunningly <laughs> obvious, which is that the Democratic candidate uh, Fred Duvall is going to have a tough hill to climb if he wants to win. But in terms of you know my prediction, I think we talk about that elections bill, the massive elections bill that's, that was passed last year, that's going to be on the ballot next year for voter approval. And, if, and that will have an impact. That will have an impact, and I, but I think at the end of the day, voters are going to be scared off by the specter of voter fraud, and they're gonna support that law. And, and on that note, we're gonna have to end. We'll, we'll come back next year and see if you all were right and see what happened. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, if you missed any previous episodes of Horizonte, just go to our website, azpbs.org slash Horizonte. While you're on our site, you'll also find transcripts and upcoming show information. That's our show for tonight from all of us here at 8 and Horizonte. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good night. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of 8, members of your Arizona PBS station.